Welcome to the Ballet Help Desk podcast. My name is Jenny, and I am joined by my co-founder, Brett. We are both proud ballet moms who met backstage at our children's recital. During our kids' training, we found that resources were limited, and we relied on dance magazines and fellow parents in the lobby for information. Now that our children are embarking on their professional careers, we are excited to share our combined 20 years of experience as ballet moms with all of you. We will be bringing in experts to help make sense of this complex world of ballet training. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Katya and Kati Orofsky from South Mississippi Ballet School. We are grateful for their generosity in sharing their deep wisdom and expertise. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here with Katya and Arkady Orahovsky. They are the directors of the South Mississippi Ballet Theater in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So Katya and Arkady, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So I want to I want to just jump in. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about your background and then also how you came to um, start a ballet school in Mississippi? <laughs> Yeah, I'm first. Yes. So I grew up in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev. I was there in a ballet school for eight years and then joined National Opera of Ukraine. Uh, danced for six years there, uh, lots of solo and principal roles. And we were touring a lot, so all over the world um, for Thank six years. Kratansky. Yes. Uh, then, uh, then in 94, I ended up in America and... Uh, dance here and there a little bit small companies and then in 2000 i joined uh houston ballet was there for five years with ben stevenson uh, until 2005 and then uh we met yes and then we end up in mississippi because katya grew up here and her parents lived here and so now we have school here so um i grew up in mississippi i started ballet as physical therapy. Um, I had severe rheumatoid arthritis starting at age six. I was in a wheelchair and very stubborn person. I like to be told I can't do something. So when I was nine, um, my parents found an amazing teacher here that was willing to work with a kid that could barely walk. And I just fell in love with ballet and, you know, worked as hard as humanly possible. I did not have the most perfect of anything. And so ended up training at Nutmeg Conservatory back in the 90s and then Kirov Academy. And unfortunately, I developed an eating disorder and I had to take about two years off. I just gotten offered my first contract with Boston and um, I needed to regroup mentally and emotionally. It was extremely close. I took a year deferment to law school and decided I was going to give Bali one more go and started training again, got back in shape. And I met Alkadi. Um, our friend was doing a production and uh, he was Mariansky dancer and brought us within because we look similar and our, our styles are very complimentary. And we've been together ever since. And so we had a school in Ohio and our son was born and my family is still here and Arcadi's mom was living in Houston and the teacher that I started with wanted to retire. And she said, hey, you know, I have nine students left. You want to come back and start a program and take over. And it was a good call and, you know, free babysitters with the grandparents. And we've been here ever since. You know, ballet in Mississippi is pretty much a non-thing. Um, we had a ballet company for a while. Bahonis was the last director. It folded. Um, we have an amazing Christian company called Ballet Magnificat in Jackson, but really no true classical pre-professional program in the state. And, you know, the closest professional company is Alabama Ballet in Birmingham. And then New Orleans has started a very small company just now. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of a ballet wasteland. And, you know, the USA IBC comes every four years by a decree of Congress. So and that's the, the one time that ballet is on the map in Mississippi. So, so yeah, that's how we're here. It's fantastic. It, and it's nice to hear from somebody who is doing something outside kind of the ballet meccas in the country. Um, I'm sure it's a, a much needed program that you guys are bringing. It is. And, you know, when I was growing up, seven of my classmates and I, including myself, ended up dancing professionally, which we, our city is 80,000 people. So statistically, that's insane. And, you know, we've had some extremely gifted students. Um, and, you know, we try to offer it. We have kids that can meet an hour and a half, two hours each way. 
it's, it is needed. And, you know, if we can keep kids at home to be with their parents as long and still offer high quality training, you know, we never keep a child longer than they need to be here. But I also left at 14. He grew up in boarding school. We also know that, you know, that stability at home is, is vital. Um, and when the time comes that they're mentally and emotionally as well as technically prepared. That's fantastic. I want to turn to ballet competitions, which I know you're very familiar with. So a lot of listeners um, have dancers who might not know a a lot about the world of ballet competitions. They may be younger, they may just be starting down this path. Can you talk about kind of what the competition landscape looks like out there? The competitions became really popular. It started in Varna with the IBC and then Moscow, then Jackson and then Helsinki. Um, and those were geared more to, you know, high level professional dancers. I mean, you had dancers like Borishnikov winning those competitions. And so competitions were really out of the reach for most people and most dancers. Prita Lazan started specifically gearing towards students and opening opportunity for those dancers for either school schools, you know, and or company contracts. And then the dance competition scene grew exponentially. And I think it all so much. And then, you know, Larissa with YAGP. She was judging regular dance competitions and she would, and she'll tell you that she would watch a classical variation and there'd be a cartwheel in the middle of it. And she's like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and you know, ballet dancers were not doing that. So she founded YAGP to give opportunity for ballet dancers to be seen. You know, the reason that we started doing it in Mississippi, again, we have nothing here. My students um, have nobody in the state really, you know, to work with. I mean, there's ballet Mississippi, but it's again, focus is a little different. So for us as teachers, um, we started going to YGP so our students can see what their peers are doing for major programs. And as teachers, we can make sure that we are doing right by our students, that it informs us of where the level is. And it there's a ballet competition or a dance competition out there for anybody. Um, you have so many different ones with so many different emphasis, like, you know, YGP. Anybody can enter. You can choose to enter only contemporary or only classical. You will see all levels in the regionals. Then you have ADC IBC, which is a little bit more like the Creed Lausanne, where your classwork and your technical work is taken as one third of your score. So that's a very different focus. So it's, you know, if you do a great variation, but your technique is lacking, you can't win. And vice versa, if you have a great technique class and you have a fumble on stage, it will hold you up. So again, different focus. I feel like that one's geared more for like higher training levels than just a general you have a world ballet competition which offers like olympic style scoring so you know you're sitting in a kiss and cry area like in the olympics and everything is you know the scores come up on the board there's 10 judges they drop the highest and the lowest so it it gives the appearance more of fairness in a sense that that's there but you know but then you also have to deal with the psychological effect of everybody in the audience seeing what your scores are and not all kids can handle that either so there's a little bit of something out there for everybody. World Belly Competition, we've never done that one, but I've heard absolutely incredible things about it. I love that there's two levels. You have the intermediate level and the competitive level mm-hmm. so that kids that are not in major training programs don't feel like they're going to be blown out of the water by kids that are. That they can still you know, take pride in what they're doing at the appropriate level. So, Which ones does your studio do primarily? We primarily do YAGP and ADC, IBC. You know, we've done pre design, we've done, you know, the big competitions, but those are for very specific students. But the majority of our kids, that's where we go. How many do you typically take to each of those? We've taken as many as 22. We've taken as few as eight. So it just depends on the year, the interest, and, you know, 10, 20, yeah, usually 10 and 20. This year, I think we're taking 15, maybe 14, because it's just the two of us. Adds a lot to our day, so we pretty much live in the studio seven days a week. Um, sure. Most of the time we took uh, kids, uh, sometimes uh, not not the perfect three kids, we're taking 15, because usually it helps uh, yeah. to bring uh, to lift the whole level of the whole school. Yeah. So that's why there's training for everyone. That, that, that and I, that I would say that's the good thing about YAGP, you know, that you do have dancers there that are so raw and new and maybe with coaches that don't have experience on how to coach, but then they also see what's out there and they're like, oh, Maybe I need to start doing this and take it more seriously. And their parents start becoming exposed to how the ballet world is. And like, you know, I'm taking two days a week. That's plenty. And then they get there and they see these kids and they're in the studio, you know, 30 hours a week. And so they they don't even know that that's option. So I think it's an education across the whole board. And I love that there, there's a place for everybody. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. You know, the thing that I 
we tell a lot of parents is if your child is interested in pursuing serious ballet as they get older, you constantly need to be putting yourself on a bigger stage because you might be the greatest kid in your neighborhood or even in your county or state. But once you get out, you, you get a sense of where you fit. And I think it's really important. And especially as kids are getting older, to constantly be evaluating where they fit against everybody else. Right. You know, one of the other interesting experiences, and like there's a lot of debate whether you should have nine year olds competing or if there should even be a pre competitive category. But, you know, my son's own example, and I know your son too, you know, my son started competing at nine because he's never around other boys. He was right. terrible. And, but, you know, he caught the judge's attention, and those judges, have stayed with him. He's now 16. You know, they reach out to us. They they see year to year and they watch these kids grow and progress. And it really started, if they continue with it, getting into 17, 18 contract offers. And these people and these major players in the ballet world have seen these kids progress over this long period of time. It's so much more of an insight than just a snap audition for an hour and a half. Yeah, absolutely. When you are talking to your kids in your studio about competitions, what's the philosophy that you bring to um, those conversations? Number one, we're not a competition school. And number two, you do not go to win, period. That's the very first thing that we prepare, along. you're not going to get trophies. So if you do, experience. congratulations. But that is not our focus in training for competitions. The reward, the placement is not what's valuable. It's the process that's valuable. It's taking a variation, our artistic and musicality. Um, those two things will stay with you your entire career. Technique you can teach. Technique can continue to improve and grow. But that artistry and that musicality, that's something that, that you can have to have. Too, but it's much harder right. to develop. And so when we start preparing kids, we take the, the variation. They have to research the ballet, what the character is in the ballet, where the piece falls within the full-length ballet. And then they have to research dancers that have been notable in that role, not students that are competing, but actually professional performing artists that has made an impact in that particular role. And then we also don't let our students watch other students in that variation. Like we don't base ours, what this competition did. We try to go back to the originals. We try to go back to the artists that have made a life and also the context of a full-length ballet is very different than the context of a variation of competition. In most professional companies, you're not going to see more than three pirouettes on stage, period, because the musicality won't let you. Competition, you're seeing seven and eight. That's not reality. And so it's not that our kids can't do it, and it's not that we've made concessions to allow them to do it, but I want them to understand that when they are dancing in the context of the ballet, that is not what the focus of variation is. So then they're not solely focused on the big tricks. They're focused on all the little intricate steps in between that makes dance dance. So that's how we approach it. I think that's great because, you know, you're hearing more and more about tricks are taking over. And um, it sounds like you're focusing a lot more on the, you know, the elements that really matter in ballet yeah. as the kids move into professional right. careers. So let's talk a little bit about, let's say you've identified your students that are going to go to a competition. It's the beginning of the school year. It's What's the process that you go through with your kids from the point where it sounds like you you have them research a variation? Do you pick a variation or, or do they? It's kind of a combination. So I usually will narrow it down. Like when our students, if it's their first time competing, we focus on a single variation. Sometimes second year we'll do two. Sometimes they repeat the one they did previously and we add a new one so that they gain confidence in one they've already danced but are still constantly actively working on something new. I don't like a variation that is too rehearsed. It yeah, still needs right, to have yeah. some spontaneity in anymore. it. The kids right. can't be bored with it. I would, I, will, say, I would say 90% will always recommend. Yeah, variation. that's what I was going to say. Sometimes we'll pick two yeah. or three and, and I let the kids watch those three and then they pick the one that they you know, and if I do have a strong preference, a lot of times for the first several yeah. rehearsals, we'll work both. And you, a lot of times, whatever my preference was, even if I don't, they end up in that one because they're looking at the big picture, the costume or the music, but then they start working and they're like, oh, wait, maybe this does suit me a little bit better. And then a couple of years later, when they become a little more confident what they want, and then sometimes they're saying, oh, next year, I want to do this variation. Yes. I was like, uh, probably not, but you can try. Surprise us. If you prove that you can do that, 
And actually, it happened a couple of times. Yes. And uh, we're like, okay, that's surprise. You can right. do it. Competed a lot. So they, you know, they starting to understand what looks good on them. And like, I want to give variations that are challenging to them, not so out of their reach, they can't do it well, but not simple so that it's absolutely perfect, but they've not grown any in the process of learning it. Right. So I want to push their technique somewhat, but or, also... Or, or sometimes you do two variations. Yes, one, one that's a little easier. One to show their and the other one... To push them, yeah. Sure. I think that's great, especially when it's a little bit out of their reach and they're not quite sure that they can get there, but it gives right. them really something to, to go after. Right. Um, I would think that would be really appealing to a lot of the kids. What is the... so? You have your variation chosen. What's the schedule you follow? Do you do rehearsals outside of class? You know, you hear all the time about, well, this competition school, all they do is rehearse. No, that is not us at all. Yeah, can you talk uh, about that schedule? Yeah, so we also do full-length ballet performances every year. We usually do at least two, if not three. Um, and, you know, because again, most of our, most dancers on the planet will not become professional dancers. But when you fall in love with an art, there's so many different outlets. So, you know, we're doing, you know, seven performances of Nutcracker every year. Last year we did Swan Lake, the full length Swan Lake. We staged it in five weeks. For costume design, we teach them about costume design. We teach them about lighting effects and about backdrops and scenic design and stage managing so that they're really getting an education, not just in the classroom and on the stage, but behind the scenes on the stage. So that's super important to us. We used to not start rehearsals for YAGP or ADC until six weeks before the competition. Now we start in August, like we just started this week. Um, if they're doing one variation, they get a 30 minute rehearsal once a week. If they're doing two, they get an hour. And then because once Nutcracker rehearsals get heavy, it, it we take a hiatus and we focus now on the full length performance. And then after Nutcracker, we go back into it. And that is not our focus, our winning competitions. Our focus is getting on stage and doing the absolute best that they physically and technically can do at this moment in time but without pulling away from their training. Like I feel like some spend three, four, five hours a week in the studio focusing only on classical variation. Then it's, yeah, again, it's flawless, but you look at those same dancers in class and their technique is a mess. We never do rehearsals in class time. That way, you know, if kids can't perform, they're still getting their technique class every single day. Um, if they can, you know, we don't charge for extra rehearsals. We're doing rehearsals in the evenings after classes or on the weekends, but it's never either or. And, you know, we have a requirement that they must maintain a certain number of technique classes per week without rehearsals in order to participate in these things. Because, again, our goal is not to win a single competition. Our goal is to train professional dancers, and it's a different focus. I think that's great. I, you know, I never understood the whole notion of like, they perform really well on stage, but then you get into the studio until my son pointed it out. And he said, yeah, you can rehearse something forever and do it perfectly. But then you get into the studio and your technique may still need a lot of work. Yeah. A different variation or different role. Right. And will fall apart. You know, and yeah. you know, when you audition for a company, you take class. You don't do a variation. You take class. Right. That's a good point. So when, when you are getting your kids ready, how do you work with them to set goals? I would imagine they're different for each kid, but how do you, yeah, how do you work with kids to set those? So at the beginning of the year, we sit down with them and we do a short-term and long-term goal for the year. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually per semester. Um, and they set one goal that they want to work on short-term. I, or Akadi and I will set one goal that we want them to work on and then same thing long-term. Um, and then from the variations, um, when we do our first or second rehearsal, depends, you know, we sit down, we look at the variation that's chosen and we're like, okay, first question I ask them is what story do you want to tell on stage with this variation? Like, what are we focusing on? Are we focusing on facial upper body understanding what the role is? Are we focusing on super clear, clean, clean technique? Are we focusing on, you know, adding multiple pirouettes, you know, instead of doing two, are we going to focus on three? So, you know, and then we also focus on what are we wanting to get out of it? You know, and they never can say I want to win, period. Um, you know, that can be a goal for some of them, but realistically for most it isn't. Okay. In the course of our rehearsals, you know, I want to gain confidence in this area, or I want to translate 
this skill in class into this variation. So it's just, and it's very different for each kid and like what, you know, where they are in the process. One, one girl last year said, I want all the judges to comment that I have a beautiful border bra. That was her goal. That's great. You know, so it's things like that, like, it, you know, it informs or like, I want somebody to look and say that I have really strong point work. So it's little, little details that are totally accomplished, like you can accomplish, um, but that are, again, it's that growth mindset and not fixated on one point in time. It's so interesting because really what you hear often, or at least my experience, my limited experience is focuses on um, winning and scholarships to ballet programs. And quite honestly, both of those are in short supply unless you yeah. make it to finals or to the final right. round of whatever these right. competitions are. But there are thousands of kids who are doing this that will never get that far. So it's, yep. it's great to hear that you're setting goals that are much more individual and, um, oh, and also attainable. I don't like setting goals that are determined by other people. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go on and dance the best variation of your life and still not win or still not make it to finals because these set of judges have one specific thing they're looking for and you may not have that thing. So I don't like them to then come off stage feeling like a failure when they dance beautifully because somebody else's opinion does not line up with theirs. Right. So that's why we really stay away from it. And we always tell, and like, if I have kids, you know, we usually have at least one student in, fi in finals, invited to finals every year. And I tell them like, you know, and I tell the parents going in too, most of the kids that are at finals could walk into an audition and get a full scholarship. Getting a full scholarship at finals is really difficult because you have the best of the best. All of those kids are talented. All of those kids have beautiful facility, spending thousands upon thousands of dollars. So again, if that is your goal, there's a lot easier way to do that. That's a whole lot less expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our goal, you know, with kids, for instance, kids that do make it to finals, it's networking, it's making friends, it's, you know, experiencing multiple teachers' classes so that you can make informed decisions on what summer programs you want to go to. It's things like that that is within your control and not within somebody else's. And because then when they do that, they always feel like they've succeeded, like they don't feel like they failed. You know, you raise an interesting point about networking. And we've talked to um, a lot of parents about this, that networking can never start too early as a student. At all. And, you know, my son, I think, you know, he's in a second company now. He met some kids at YAGP finals when he was 11, who are also now all in second companies. And, you know, are they good friends? Not necessarily because they scattered across the world, but they all still follow each other on Instagram. They're still in touch. Um, via social media. And it's been really interesting to kind of watch that relationship continue that was right. based on, you know, 10 days in New York City when they were 11 years old. And I think kids don't, I think kids and parents underestimate the value of the network. That, because um, they have to remember the ballet world is so small. Right. Um, and the kids that they're competing with at 10 and 11, if they continue, those are going to be their colleagues professionally. Exactly. So keeping that contact, saying, you know, a girl, she's her sister and I danced together. She's a little bit younger than us, went to a boarding school and was roommates with a now very famous principal dancer that she was the girl that I'm referring to was dancing in another company. And this principal who was in a soloist calls her and says, hey, a girl got hurt. They need to fill a court of ballet. Get up here now and take class. And she was offered the contract. She's been with the company 18 years. That's the connection. And it's because they've been, they've been roommates since they were 13 years old. And, you know, things like that, like they happen a lot. Being at the right place at the right time happens a lot. But also having people that can tell you, hey, this is the right place at the right time. Get here. Right. You know? And, you know, you never know if you're going to need a couch to surf on coming to an audition and saying, hey, I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I'm going to be in. Can we get to coffee? Can I sleep on your couch for the night? And right. I've never known a dancer not to say absolutely because they're right. all in it together. They understand the struggle. Sure. And, it, you know, it's an, the other thing I always told my son um, and we tell other parents is, you know, be nice. Like a hundred percent. Your reputation will will get started really early. And if you develop a right. reputation for being somebody that's willing to bend over for somebody else and, you know, really help them out, that's only going to serve you well in the future. And when you're at a ballet competition, 
you are, you're competing, but these are also people you're going to see over and over again. And, you know, two things with that, we tell our kids, the only person you're in competition with is yourself and being complimentary and appreciating a dancer that was phenomenal does not take away from your talent or your ability, but that, you know, and I think the boys have it so much better than the girls because there is that competitiveness but they're literally in the wings egging each other on like, like, Oh my God, that was amazing. I'm going to try this. And it's just, you know, so my son competed at the USAIBC this summer. The thing that was the coolest thing for him, all of the dancers in the junior category they were there with the exception of like four, they all knew each other. So when they weren't on stage or rehearsing, they were in the dorms building forts out of air mattresses and playing volleyball. And so there was this, just this camaraderie and you saw it actually in that group with the girls too, you know, much more than you usually do. And that's what I told, you know, I told my students, I'm like, you're not in competition with them, make friends, learn from them. If you see somebody that you're doing something that you can't do or that you want, that you like, figure it out. Don't get jealous. It's, but then another thing about competitions and about setting your reputation. And, you know, I found this very interesting, you know, my son won youth Grand Prix at the YGP finals in 2022 Um, And he had a massive amount of offers. And it's really interesting because you think that winning a major competition can can help. And it does. But there's caveats to that. And one director that we were very, he left the school, so it didn't work. But, you know, he he said, I require now all dancers that I'm accepting into a year-round program to come and stay for a week. It's not because they're talented or I'm worried about their technique. He said, if they're, you know, it's established. It's whether they are able to be worked with. It was like, we've had so many competition winners that have come and they're impossible to teach or a, they feel like because they've won all of this, they don't have to work as hard as everybody else. That they're so talented that, you know, things should just be given to them or B, you know, they're so stuck on something that they're not open-minded enough to try something new because they're afraid of not looking as good in your reputation. People talk, you know, if you're being rude and ugly to other dancers, it gets around other directors see it they start talking and you may lose an opportunity from a school because of that because they don't want problem kids they don't want kids that are going to cause drama or, or issues the, the sooner kids learn that and the parents learn it because people watch the parents if you're causing problems you have to be careful if you see something that is wrong or there's something you you should speak up but if you're speaking out of jealousy or frustration or sour grapes and causing constantly being in the middle of trauma directors will take a step back and like I'm not sure I want to deal with that I mean the kid could be phenomenal but it's like is it really worth having to deal with the headache that's being caused in school directors too others other teachers and other directors if they're you know causing issues backstage or with other teachers or with their students I I know for a fact directors have not made offers to these some of these kids because they don't want to deal with the headache That's really interesting. Do you, when you're getting, like, let's say you've got a dancer that hasn't done a ballet competition before, you know, you talk to the kids, but you're also, it sounds like you, you also coach the parents. 100%. They have to sign their own contract. Yeah. What do you, how do you prepare the parents? Like I know when, when my son did YHUP for the first time, going from like, a, a showstopper or a spotlight, you know, a, a like competition school competition to YAGP was a big culture shock for us. Sure. Because it, you know, there's no screaming from the wings and, you know, yelling from the audience. But when you talk to parents, what do you tell them to expect and also how they're expected to conduct themselves? Conduct, like the thing they have to sign is they must 100% be positive all the time. I need them to be their children's cheerleaders. I need to be the coach. Arcadi needs to be the one giving corrections. I don't want to see a kid come off stage and then immediately go to mom and say, how did I do? Or dad. And they say, oh, well, it's not as good. That is not what's needed. That conversation can be had later. Right now, I mean, I think especially parents that have never danced before, I don't think they realize how much these kids put on that stage, how mentally and physically and emotionally draining going out there and giving 2000% is. And if they're coming to you asking that question, number one, they probably didn't like something that they did. I've never known a dancer to be happy with your performance for the most part. I mean, elements, yes, but there's always something. And number two, they're asking that question is saying, I need reassurance that what I just did was good enough. 
So, you know, and that's Arkady and I will not give corrections either immediately after a performance or immediately after a competition. We we set a meeting, usually a week later. Yes, to meet with the parent and the student. We sit down and we don't forward them their scores. We always give them their scores, but we do it on a one-on-one. We go through what the judges' comments were. We go through, you watch the video of the performance, and we talk about elements. Okay, and we start by asking the kid, what, first of all, what did you like? You have to name at least three things that you liked about your performance. Where do you think you can improve? And then we talk the same thing. I love this and this. I think you really improved here. We need to work on this. I think it can develop. And that's also teaching parents how to approach their kids. We've dealt with parents that have been so negative through the whole process that it just sucks the joy out of it, you know, and they're com- and the other thing we, we tell them, you cannot compare your child to somebody else, period. Each child develops differently. Each child has their strengths and weaknesses, especially if it's something completely out of their control. Like you cannot get upset because your child is not five foot seven with, you know, legs for days and, and super high in steps. That's genetics. The more you do that, like we, we've not brought a kid back the following year specifically because it was became such a toxic situation for the child each competition has a very different atmosphere for whatever reason ygp is a pressure cooker i don't know if too many people have drunk the kool-aid i don't know i i feel like a lot of people think that ygp is the be all end all and if you're not successful at ygp you will not have a successful career which is not i mean it couldn't be further from the truth right so you have, it's also an extremely large competition that, you know, you have a lot of very type A children all in the same place. You have a lot of very sage mom type parents in the same place and all of that wrapped into it. it it's a lot, you know, and then you have other competitions like ABC, IBC, where it is overall regionals is a much harder competition um, to be successful in on the criteria, not based on numbers. But it's so much more of a relaxed environment. And again, I think because it's not as big as YGP, the the reputation isn't as high as YGP. A relatively newer competition, like they just started regionals last year um, before it was very select dancers. Like you had to send videos in to get into the finals. So getting there already, you know, it's like YGP finals, but on a much smaller scale. It doesn't feel as intense or pressured. Um, World Ballet competition to me, is a very stressful competition as well because the scores are posted, the rankings are posted every single day. It's You have to be a very mature person um, and mentally as a dancer to be able to see where you're ranking and not let that mental pressure affect you. And I can we can talk a little bit more later, but my son's experience at YGB Finals the year he won was terrible. And it wasn't from anybody else. It was the pressure that he was putting on himself. He didn't want to let people down. You know, YHP had used him in some promo things and he felt like he had this this reputation he had to live up to. And I've never seen my son like that. My son has competed at YHP for years. It was just do not underestimate the amount of pressure these kids put on themselves. And I think that's what surprises parents the most because you can have the most laid back, fun loving kid and you never know the first time they compete how they're going to respond to it. All the years that we've been competing, I've only ever had one kid not have a positive experience. And it was because the kid does not work well under pressure. We did not know that until we brought them there. And she just kind of collapsed and fell apart. She never mm-hmm. competed for her because for her, it was not, it was not productive. So we also try to limit social media, especially for our younger students. Mm-hmm. Because I'm like, just because you see these kids on Instagram doing nine pirouettes and posing in this beautiful position doesn't mean they can dance. So if you, you know, even open stage is very telling. You see these kids psyching each other out and doing everything that's not even in their variation. And then they get on stage and they're barely able to pull off two pirouettes. So I'm like, you have to stay focused on yourself. We tell the parents, never underestimate the pressure, whether they've ever done it or not, that these perfectionist kids put on themselves. And if you can mitigate that, if you can keep the atmosphere relaxed behind the scenes, you know, if you can keep it fun and you can constantly remind them this is about the experience, it's not about winning, then you can't, it, it really helps. These judges know what he's capable of, and they also know what it's like to be 14 years old. They know that they haven't had time to control their nerves, and that extra spike of adrenaline can wreak havoc on your technique. I think another thing that 
that dancers and parents have to be aware of. These judges are not expecting perfection at all. Far from it. We've been criticized when Alexei was younger that he was wild and he needs to be more careful and more precise. And then at the same time, other judges have said the thing we love the most about him is that he's wild and he takes risk and he never holds back. You know, perfectionism is a, is a, is a dangerous thing. It can completely stunt your growth and cause you all kinds of mental anxiety. And, you know, so you have to remind these, these dancers and these kids, if they make a mistake on stage, it doesn't matter in the grand. It's how you recover from it. You know, yeah. they're just not expecting no, you to fall and you know, like, oh, please fall. And, and we'll no, go they're up. rooting for they're, you. Right. They all of those judges are rooting for you. They've been in your position. They've all been students. They right. know what it feels so, like. So when I think when dancers understand that the judges are former dancers and they're humans, and yes, some of them became principal dancers, but they all started in the same place that our students are. They were students. Mm -hmm. And we said, no. And if you make a mistake, Get back up, smile bigger, dance better, and the mistake literally actually can help you in that sense. Because recovering from a mistake, yes, it happens, yeah, yes. recovering from a mistake or a fall, and 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 dancing better shows how nerves of steel, and that's valuable. And so, you know, mistakes happen. Watch professional dancers; they fall all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I think letting the kids and the parents know that going in that. You're not expected to be perfect. The judges are not expecting you to be perfect. You know, they're except, expecting a certain level of technique for your age. Make it memorable. I was very embarrassed. At ADC, IBC, one of the interesting things about that competition is before awards, they do a question answer session with the jury. And the students can ask any questions that they want and the jury. And so if you could just pick one variation to go up in flames that you never want to see again what is it and then the judges start cracking up because they can't really say that because they don't want to offend but then Dee was the very first person to say and then the other judges started and it's like so much of the artistry has been taken out of it and they all start looking alike stop worrying about the tricks yes they're important at the sacrifice of everything else and then you're going to be memorable and stand out so speaking of standing out what's your uh feeling on costumes I don't think you should have to take out a small mortgage to pay for a costume that a child isn't going to outgrow in a year, but costumes matter. They do. They're important. It, it, it's important for the kids, like, you know, especially for girls. If you feel pretty, you dance better. If you're going on stage in a really bad costume and all of these girls have these gorgeous costumes, it, it affects your self-esteem. It affects your, you, you know, it, it messes with your head. I'm very particular about the costumes my kids wear. I'm very particular that it fits the piece, that it fits the role, that it's not garish or that it's, you know, I like, I tend to like a little more understated, a little bit more elegant, but I also. That's what I wanted to say. Yes. It, it costume matter, but if it's too much, then it's too much. It's like too much. If, if it's a boy and dancing peasant dance variation and covered with diamonds too much. Right. So it yeah. has to be. It like, has to in, fit in style, Right. Um, and, you know, because of what we do, we have an extensive costume wardrobe and, you know, all of our costumes are paid for by us and we add to them. So all of them are very professional costumes. So when we can make, we can make a costume work. I, I hand stitch and decorate and do everything. And I put a lot of energy and effort into my students' costumes so that they're not breaking the bank. Cause I already know the expense is astronomical. I, I want the parents to, to know that you don't have to pay $1,200 for a custom made tutu for a 12 year old. It's ridiculous. The dancers are older and have stopped growing and they want to invest in a costume. Usually I recommend pink or white that they can reuse for multiple things. That's a different story, but spending thousands of dollars or even upwards of hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Conservatory by Prima Donna and tutu.com make beautiful base tutus and bodices that can be embellished and decorated. There's tons of resources online. Don't be afraid to experiment. Look at different costumes, you know, and, you know, teachers, that's what I do with my students. Costumes matter. Don't use costume catalog costumes. One of the things that is just awful to me is seeing a child that's a beautiful dancer in one of the, the cheap tutus that are about that thin that sit on top of the butt, you know, just look horrible or that's not fitted to the dancer either. Think about lines. Think about their proportions. Thinking about how the overall look affects um, because it does, you know, I would much rather see a black leotard and a beautiful rehearsal tutu than a really horrible, cheap costume. But it, it does matter. And, you know, yes, technically they're not required, 
And I have seen on one occasion a dancer place that danced in only Italian tights, but it's extremely rare. And that dancer somehow was unaffected by all of the gorgeous costumes around her um, because it does affect the kids and that affects their performance, which in turn affects everything else. Sure. You wish it wasn't the case, but no. but that's the way it is. Uh, one of the things we'd love to do is put in our show notes, some resources for... Sure. I'll be happy. So, you know, you were, you were talking about how you do some full length ballets and there are, you know, there are schools that do ballet competitions because those are the performance opportunities for the kids. How do you see the two balancing one another and how do you look at it with your students in terms of how much emphasis is put on performance opportunities? The reason that we do both is if you're lucky enough to become a professional dancer, especially as a girl, the majority of your life is going to be spent in the court of ballet. Dancing a solo on stage is easy. Dancing in a core is really difficult. We have a lot. We only have 50 students in our entire school. We try We keep it small because we keep the class sizes small. Um, we open auditions for outside dancers to come in and participate in our performances. Competition, yes, it's another chance to be on stage. Yes, it's another chance to do a solo. Yes, it's another chance to get feedback. So taken out of context that I don't like relying solely on that. For a year or two, it's fine. Dancers, when they're a little bit younger, it's fine. Um, but I think as the dancer gets older, the, it, it becomes not enough. And same thing with schools that don't perform at all. I mean, ballet is a performing art. You you can be the best dancer on the studio and fall flat on stage, and you're not going to go very far career-wise. Sure. So you have to have that exposure. You don't want to see a dancer starting auditioning for companies and look like a deer in the headlights on stage. And that's really what separates a professional dancer from a student, is just being able to take a risk on stage knowing how to be comfortable in your own skin in the context of a, of, of a performance, you know, even in contemporary, um, you know, it may not have a story behind it, but there's a character that you're playing. There's a feel there's, and you have to learn how to express yeah, I was that. thinking there's some schools of, uh, which not doing spring performance because it's too expensive or too expensive to rent backdrops or too expensive something. Yes. Maybe sometimes we'll look, we'll lose a couple of thousand dollars, yeah. but uh, it's worth it because of experience for kids and it's bringing, uh, the, the whole school level up and plus new students going to come in August because of the performance in a way. So it, it's still beneficial on other sides. So for instance, like my son trained for a year at elite classical coaching, amazing training. I mean, what they did for him was incredible. You know, they only have 14 dancers in their program. They can't do full length ballets. But one thing that she does do is encourage Catherine, the director encourages her students to audition for local nutcrackers that will give them that outlet to perform, you know, if you can't provide it, don't hold your dancers so that they never get that experience either. It's a trio. You have to focus on the technique, you know, in the competition, the competition gives exposure like no other thing can. And then the performance gives the dancers as much experience as possible before they join a company. There is a perception that some of these ballet competitions are, for lack of a better term, rigged. What is your sense um, and, and what would you say to a parent who makes that claim? Not at all. You know, I know there's been some controversy. The judges that I know that I've known for years and years and years, first as students, now as colleagues, they have incredible amount of integrity. They would never undermine a student for politics or for money. I, I, I don't know a single one that would. If you, if you really want to get the download, talk to the guy, the people that judge. You know, Vicki Schneider from Herod, who's one of my mentors, has been very vocal saying, I have never once been asked to change a score. And I've never once judged Steve where the winner that the judges pick was not the winner that was called out. And I think that speaks volumes. People say it's not transparent enough because the criteria. But the problem with ballet, it's subjective. A different set of judges on a different day could have a totally different winner. And what each judge values may not be the same as what he values. Actually, our values are very different. Like what we look for first in dancers, they're complementary, but they're different. I will give a higher score for musicality and artistry, and he will give a higher score for technique, artistry too. Um, but he pays a little bit more attention to physique. I'm less worried about physique, I mean, within realms of classical ballet and more worried about what a dancer says on stage personally. 
So it's different. Or some uh, judges look for clean technique, right. and, and some judges look for emotional and memorable and performance. And want to see taking risks and not holding back. Some schools win more than others because that school has incredible students. You know, again, elite classical coaching. She's very particular about who she takes into her program. Her dancers are exquisitely trained. They're going to do well no matter where they go. Um, so it can it can appear as being favoritism. But it really isn't. Now, Larissa, you know, will match a dancer for a school because she knows what that particular school is looking for. And, will, you know, say, hey, I have this dancer. This take a look at them because I think they would fit your criteria. But as far as like actually, you know, the school directors are the ones that make the decisions. The judges are the ones that make the decisions. And some of the frustration is that it's a competition. But if you read their um, mission statement, it's a scholarship competition. The scholarships matter. And the ballet world is super small. It's super small. Um, there's that saying about the six degrees of separation. In the ballet world, you can say it's one or two. So all of us that judge, we're all colleagues. We're all friends. We may see a judge and sit there and talk about it. I will promise you 99.9% .9 of the time, we're not even talking about ballet because that's the last thing we want to talk about right now. Yeah. Uh, we're just talking about how are you? How's your family? What's this? You know, How's this dancer that used to dance with you? What are they doing? And it's never about the competition per se. And, you know, I know that like Alexei Moskalenko teaches at a lot of different schools and a lot of heavy hitter schools. But again, the ballet world is small. He's a brilliant teacher. You don't, you can't ask him not to guess because of perceived influence that might have on the dancers that win. It, it's, it really is a difficult balance. And I think parents really don't understand that perspective. These judges have a lot of integrity just because they're doing private lessons. And actually, I wanted to speak on this. Most judges, if they have a student or they've worked with a student, will recuse themselves for judging, mm -hmm. you know. But pretty much most of those judges had at one time or another worked with a good number of those kids. Mm -hmm. The problem that you have and the danger that you have, if you're working with a YHP judge as a solo, you're always, I mean, most of the time, you're going to be better in the studio than you are on stage. So if a judge has seen you nail this, this, this over and over and over, and you don't do it on stage, you're more than likely going to be judged harsher than the judges that you've not worked with. Um, so that whole, oh, well, they've worked together. They're going to be nicer. That's usually completely the opposite direction that it will go um, because they know what you're capable of. Instead of not knowing and being impressed, they're like, oh, well, that was terrible compared to how you've been running it. So that's a perspective that I think most parents have never really even thought about. You know, that's something well, sometimes that vice versa, you they know what he's capable of doing. And uh, sometimes he, he, if you mess up on stage, it doesn't matter because and everybody enjoying performance. They're enjoying the performance. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so and then, though, it does work that if you do something you've never done on stage, that judge does know it. It's like, wow, that was amazing. Do it again. So it, it goes both ways. Um, I think part of the problem, too, is having, and this is something that we talk to our parents about, having a dancer place first and not be invited to finals and having a dancer in the top 12 that was. Yeah. That's hard. And I understand that it's hard. And, you know, YGP a long time ago used to take the top three winners, but YGP at that time is a lot smaller. This is pre-first position. Okay. And, you know, having that score set that the only way you can automatically qualify is by setting the score. Well, in most regionals, that score is never even met. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it does become at the discretion of the judges. And again, it goes back. You have to look at who the scholarship presenters are at finals. The purpose of finals is to get in front of those scholarship presenters. If you have this amazing dancer that plays second, that dance the heck out of it, but is absolutely not what any of those judges are going to be are awarding. What is the reason to bring them to finals and spend thousands and thousands of dollars when you already know that they're not going to get any offers? To me, that's unethical. It, it needs to be talked about the process and why that it is a competition and it is and it's treated as a competition. First, second and third place are awarded. But finals is a completely separate event. Another thing that people complain about is the, the Hope Award or the Youth Grand Prix Award or that in the regionals it's spelled out, but at finals it isn't. It's not spelled out that it's the top scoring dancer in this in this category. A lot of the time, the dancer they feel is going to have the best career long term or who has the most potential at this time. What are your goals for the competition? It all goes back to that. 
Sure. Um, and so I, I can see how that can give the appearance of something being rigged. But in all honesty, the judges, all of the judges that I know would never, ever think to do that. Maybe if somebody donates a lot of money, they might be given a little bit of preferential treatment in the classroom or used for photographs or used on social media, but it doesn't affect the actual placement and the, 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 the directors of these programs that are giving scholarships are going to invite exactly who they want, regardless of any other thing. I can see the perception, you know, all, all competitions are accused of that. You know, you're going to have dancers that sometimes when that you're raising your eyebrow, well, this girl was so much better technically. And again, sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's the overall picture, um, especially with younger dancers. So much of it is about potential. Sure. Uh, you know, and seeing and like, you know, dancers, I've, I've had this conversation that the parents that I see that I'm like, this kid is going to be phenomenal in five years. And the kids are like, she's awkward and she's not coordinated. And I'm like, but you can't see what's coming. Like, you don't see the wellness that's there. And so it's hard. It's really hard. I feel for parents. And that's why I hate competitions overall, because the ballet competition is a bubble. It does not reflect reality of the ballet world as a professional. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. And then as you're doing that, if you could also talk about in that context, what are some of the things you'd like to see change so it's it becomes less of a bubble? Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to add, like, there's uh, probably 90% of principal dancers in the big companies who never won competitions. They might have competed. I think more and right. more dancers now the, are competing at a young age, right. maybe once or twice just for the experience. It, but it, it absolutely is not what gave them their career. So there's lots and lots of dancers who never compete and they become, they have great careers. But by bubble, what I mean by that, and, you know, and because YGP, and I keep bringing up YGP because it is the best known competition. It's the biggest competition. Sure. Um they're able to do these galas all over the world and they're able to bring these young dancers and to do these, these ridiculously incredible performance. But like with my son, we always told him, I don't want you to be the best 11 year old on the planet. I don't even want you to be the best 14 year old. I'm looking for you to be the best at 26 and 27. In all the competitions, you know, we'll find these absolute prodigious young dancers that are just incredible at 10 and 11 and 12 and doing things so beyond what they're capable of. But it goes back to even um, prodigies in music. You know, by the time they become adults, by the time everybody else has caught up with them, which most do, they're not recognizable anymore. And I think where ballet competitions have hurt that is that these kids get so used to being the star that then they get into a company and they're not. And it's a really difficult thing to handle. Or they get into a major training program where every kid in that school is phenomenal. And now they're just one of 12 or one of 24. And they they don't know how to handle that. They don't know how to be self-motivated. They don't know how to be able to work without all of the attention. And that's another dangerous thing about doing only privates is you have the, the, the teacher's direct attention the whole time you're there. That's not reality. That's not how things work. Getting into the core, even if you're this phenomenal with very rare exception, you're going you're gonna to have to prove yourself again. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to spend lots of time standing in the very back row of Portocale, holding a spear or dancing shades and not moving, dancing in these galas all over the world in these phenomenal costumes and everything else. Um, that is not reality. That is a, a, a creative bubble that gives incredible experience. But it has to be under the caveat that you still have to train and you still have to prove yourself every time you go on that stage. And, you know, and I think that is what I would like to see competitions do. And you know, I, I really like how the pre is set up. I like how ADC is set up is that classwork is taken into consideration so that it keeps that focus on the training process, not just the, the performance. And, you know, I think YGP has started doing that, but the sheer size of YGP, it's almost impossible to do that. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's more difficult, but then you're also exposed to more people through YGP. Mm -hmm. So there is a plethora of this, but I think the biggest thing that I would like to see changed in competitions is to re-put the focus on artistry and musicality and to truly make that an equal weight. And even in the social media posts, start posting dancers that are just beautiful, 
that are doing free pirouettes perfectly, that are are expressing something and not just showing that, you know, if I'm not doing six pirouettes on point, I'm not good enough because that's not reality either. You know, these young, ridiculously bendy, stringy, talented kids that are doing all of these tricks on top of everything else, it's, it's easy for them to get all of the attention. And I think for the majority of dancers, that is not reality for them. That's never going to be a reality for them. It takes years to get to that level of second. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want dancers quitting or losing sight that this is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Right. It is very much about the entire process and you can't skip parts. And all of that creates a dancer. You know, the overemphasis on tricks and ex- ex- extremely high level of technique without making the students understand that the artistic expression you know, saying something on stage, understand what you're doing and not picking variations just to win, but to pick a variation that's going to really grow the artist. Um, Because ultimately that's what we're training our artists. You know, a lot of people think competitions are about winning and those who win end up going to have these illustrious careers, but it's really nice that you were able to kind of dispel some of those myths. So Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time. Yeah, and I want to say I love what you guys are doing because, you know, educating a student, it's also educating the parents um, because it is is definitely a family thing. Like the dancers need that support from their parents and the parents need to know how to get it in a healthy way. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And, you know, our kids were coming up. We had nothing, which is why we started. So, again, um, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, And have a great day. I would like to extend my gratitude to Katya and Kadi for generously sharing their expertise about ballet competitions. I hope you found this episode as enlightening as I did. As we conclude, I would like to share with you my favorite quote from this episode. Don't set goals determined by other people. If you liked what you heard on this episode, please take a moment to help us spread the word. Leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform, tell a friend, and share on your social media. Also, as your dancers return home from their summer intensives, please head over to theballethelpdesk.com and leave us an anonymous review of the program. Help your fellow dance parents by letting them learn all about the good, the bad, and everything in between. Stay in the loop on all of our latest content. Subscribe to our newsletter at BalletHelpDesk.com and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. Until next time, have a great day.